From the Psych Hub Podcast Network, welcome to Coming Back Better, a podcast sponsored by HCA Healthcare and in collaboration with Columbia University Department of Psychiatry. Hey, Paul. Hey, Marjorie. Welcome back to another episode of Coming Back Better. We are talking about technology and AI in mental health, which is a fascinating, cutting edge world. It really is. I mean, and at a time when all of this conversation about AI and open chat AI and all of this stuff, it's been all over the news. It's interesting to see the difference it can make and is starting to make in mental health as well. Yeah, I got to be really fortunate with a company that was building a telehealth platform the year before COVID hit. So we were ready to rock and roll, actually. And I have to admit, I had done some teaching online, but hadn't done therapy. And suddenly we were positioned to meet this massive need and things have not slowed down. If anything, the telehealth numbers are staying high at this point. And telehealth is just the beginning of what tech is going to look like with mental health. I'm a licensed mental health provider. And I think about when I was, you know, in private practice, it was all in person and you sat in front of a person and you had a conversation, but now you have companies that just do text-based counseling. And I think they use some AI based off of whether or not they have a real person doing it. You've got some of these companies that just do purely AI-based text. Then you also have some companies that are using apps and there's just so many things in the space of mental health that's evolving really just kind of based on using AI and technology. Yeah. And when I was thinking about this idea of tech and taking over the world and you know taking over jobs, it occurred to me, you know what, a hammer is technology and it didn't get rid of carpenters. It just made them more effective <laughs> and build better houses. I think that... The thing is with like software and apps, we can't quite see it. It's, you know, the mystery in the black box that maybe feels kind of scary and, you know, Oz behind the curtain. But I think, and this is going to come out in some of our conversations today about it's the idea we got to keep the human in the loop. And when I was thinking about like the Hubble telescope, now a big space geek, and how that technology allowed us to see things never seen by human eyes before, but it took a human to feel awe. And so I think that's where technology and humanness can come together and have something even more amazing occur. And also in mental health, at least, you know, you're seeing a therapist, a practitioner, but you can use it to augment the therapy, right? I mean, so it isn't like a replacement. It's just maybe you don't have to have as many sessions or in between the sessions that they could use the technology. And the reality is that the need has always outstripped the therapists that we have available and the different mental health practitioners. And so we have to depend upon technology to begin to meet the need if we're going to really make a difference. So for our conversation, if this is not just so appropriate, is that someone that we work with on this podcast had a conversation with ChatGPT, actually talked to AI about this. Let's take a listen. Where do you see the implementation of AI being used in the future? AI has the potential to be used in many areas in the future, as it is a very versatile technology. The potential applications of AI are vast and varied, and we can expect to see it being implemented in more and more areas in the future. What implementation is there for mental health? AI has the potential to improve access to mental health services, increase the accuracy of diagnoses, and provide more personalized treatment options for individuals dealing with mental health issues. Will jobs disappear for humans because AI will do them? Yes, it is likely that some jobs will disappear or be transformed as a result of AI and automation. The impact of AI on jobs will depend on the specific industry and type of work. While some jobs may be replaced by AI, others may be transformed or even created as a result of the technology. Are you aware that this causes anxiety for some people? Yes, I'm aware that the potential impact of AI and automation on the job market can be a source of anxiety for some people. How does that make you feel? As an artificial intelligence language model, I don't have feelings in the way that humans do. However, I am programmed to be empathetic and understanding of the concerns and emotions of the people I interact with. Will AI take over the world? No. It is highly unlikely that AI will take over the world. 
While AI can be a powerful technology, it is still a tool created and controlled by humans. Are you aware you are AI? Yes, I am aware that I am an AI language model. While I am not a sentient being and do not have consciousness or emotions in the way that humans do, I am programmed to simulate natural language interactions as realistically as possible. So, Marjorie, I'm sitting here and just feels kind of like a surreal world that we just listened to technology doing a session, which is fascinating. What's that old quote about, you know, it's a blessing to live in fascinating times. And I think we are. But I have to admit, I'm hearing an echo of hail in the background from 2001, like, I'm sorry, Dave, I'm afraid I can't do that. <laughs> I'm trying to, to resist the urge to let my fears be triggered and stay with, okay, it's probably, you know, the Hollywood horror stories aren't accurate and that there's actually some really good opportunities here. I definitely think so. Like, look at the cell phone. I mean, we've evolved so much. I mean, it's not going away. We've got to embrace it. We've just got to be smart about it. It's not replacing yeah, humans. Yeah. And we just got to figure out how to make everything fit. Yeah. Find how does it all come together for the needs. And I just so happened to speak to an expert about this. Dr. Albert Skip Rizzo is a clinical psychologist and director of medical virtual reality at the University of Southern California Institute for Creative Technologies. I would love to listen. I mean, I'm super curious about this. Well, welcome, Dr. Skip Rizzo. It's uh, fun to connect with you on this topic, and you've been such a pioneer in this field. So looking forward to sharing your knowledge and experience with our listeners today. Well, thanks. I really appreciate you, the invitation. I always like to get a sense of how people got into their work. And so what drew you into exploring this overlap between mental health and technology? This kind of started in the early 90s when I was working clinically in the area of brain injury rehabilitation and got very frustrated with limitations that we had back then. Not anything that leveraged what I saw as the increasing power of technology and particularly at that time with video game technology. And one day I brought in a Nintendo system into uh, the center and had some of my clients actually play a video game, Sim City, which is actually a very good executive function training game. And I saw them engaged with it, engaged way beyond yeah. what I could do with them with traditional methods. And then I learned a little bit about VR. As I got more engaged and understood more about it, I finally decided this was the way to go. And I left clinical work and took a position at USC to begin evolving it. Now, had I known how limited the technology mm -hmm. was in 1995, might have chickened out. Since 95, I, I was at USC and started a lab and made friends with computer scientists and used very expensive and clunky equipment. But we were able to, to start off doing things that began our whole research program. And over the years, that research program has evolved from just looking at cognitive training or cognitive assessment to psychological treatment, physical and occupational therapy, clinical training with virtual human mm -hmm. actors, uh, actually as virtual patients. The whole field has evolved. And again, the good news, technology has caught up with the vision and we now have a very strong scientific basis to support the work we're doing. Okay. A lot of research out there. So I must ask, virtual human, share more. What is that? They're uh, characters that are made from 3D graphics, and they have some level of voice recognition and AI. Not always. Sometimes you build these things on rails with a branching narrative. Mm -hmm. But the quality of these characters is such that you can have credible interactions. Now, you know you're talking to a virtual human. We started off in 2007 building a virtual patient of a sexual assault survivor okay. and gave medical students the opportunity to practice with this virtual patient how they would conduct a sensitive clinical interview. Okay. And even though if you look at the videos on this stuff, the thing was really, really primitive, oh, wow. not a wide okay. range of speech, but that might be natural to that mm -hmm. kind of setting where somebody feels all bottled up from that trauma. And the character didn't mm -hmm. look so real. It had very stereotyped gestures and minimal facial expression, but the language part was there. 
So when you mm-hmm. asked it a question, you got a credible response, and it led to medical students feeling more comfortable okay. practicing with this before they got their hands on a live one. The virtual human work has really evolved over the years from virtual patient to virtual healthcare coach, our sim coach project could go online and interact with his character if you were a veteran and privately and anonymously ask questions about PTSD, the character would ask the user questions back that were thinly veiled screening questions. And if the person reached a certain threshold, the character might say, hey, it looks like you're having some trouble. If you want, you can punch your zip code okay. in this little box and I'll pop up a list of providers in your area. And if you want, I can describe to you what therapy involves. So it was never a dock in a box or a replacement. But it was designed to help people put a toe in the water anonymously, privately, Ah, um, and understand their situation better, maybe get some actionable help. We've done variations on that theme with different populations. Sim Sensei, that's one that uses cameras and high fidelity audio capture to analyze facial expression and vocal parameters to kind of guide the way the character asks questions. Mm-hmm. So if the character said, how are you feeling today? And the person pauses, the voice pitch goes down, they look down a little bit. The software understands that that's a, a hard question. Even though they mm-hmm. may answer okay. after a couple of seconds, I'm all right. The character might say, I, I noticed you're hesitant on that. Are you generally a happy person or, or whatever? So you could leverage that kind of behavioral mm-hmm. analytics in quasi real time to drive the software a little bit to produce a follow on question that would engage right. the user a little bit more. And, you know, I talk about this now, back then when we were, we started doing that work, that was like, mm-hmm. you know, Star Trek science fiction <laughs> being at a holodeck. But now with everything that's going on with chat GPT and voice recognition, Alexa, it's in the popular consciousness that There is something to be had here. Okay. And it could be leveraged for positive healthcare purposes, although we have to be ever vigilant for all the unintended consequences that may arise. So many questions coming up for me. And I guess one is with all this promise, what is actually being used for treatment right now? Probably the three biggest areas. One would be for exposure therapy. For people with anxiety disorders, uh, fear of heights, fear of public speaking, fear of flying, okay, and PTSD. Mm-hmm. In all of these areas, there's really good research and randomized controlled trials to support the value of it. The second area is in pain management, okay. initially starting with Hunter Hoffman's work in early 2000, showing you could distract people from painful medical procedures by putting them in a VR headset with compelling content. Hmm. And it really reduced the perception of pain. Now people are branching out beyond the acute pain to chronic pain. Interesting. Which is a little bit different, getting someone to do things in VR that might be helpful for them to manage their chronic pain when they're outside of VR. So teaching mindfulness skills or doing certain kinds of physical activities, physical therapy activities for managing chronic pain. Transferring over. And that leads to the third major area, and that is in the physical occupational therapy rehab area where it's a very simple thing. It's basically making the very boring, repetitive, and frustrating activities of physical therapy more fun and engaging by doing it in a VR game-like environment, which also has the added value of better quantification of the patient's movement. And that is very important in this area. Fair amount of applications. Where are things going to as far as in the research and in in the further development? What do you see the promise of adding these technologies into mental health treatment? We've got a lot of core research on outcomes up to this point. And certainly science never sleeps. We're always going to expand on that. Okay. But now maybe we start to look at better predictive modeling as to who might benefit from a VR approach as opposed to traditional methods. Some people, traditional methods is what they want and and they can get better. If you can predict that in advance, you can make better treatment recommendations. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think what we call dismantling studies where you pull apart the elements of an application to try to get a better idea as to what is the active ingredient. Do you need high fidelity? 
graphics? How much does sound add to the mix? In our work with PTSD, we have the opportunity to integrate smell into the situation. Too. Oh, wow, really? Yeah, yeah, with a pretty reasonable low-cost device that fits under okay. the headset and can puff out little blasts of smell that would be relevant to the trauma context. The smell is very, very pivotal in activating emotion and memory. So that might be an added right, value. Right, right to bring into the mix if we can deliver it mm-hmm, at a low enough mm-hmm. cost we always have to to deal with this cost benefit analysis that sure if you can do a slightly better job with vr but it's going to cost a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> to deliver then you know is that cost benefit right there? right fortunately the cost of vr in healthcare has dramatically been reduced i'm curious about the the interface between a human therapist and technology and AI, if you can speak a bit to that, because you mentioned before, it's not really a replacement. So I'm curious, what is that, maybe collaboration is the right word, between human therapist and technology? Probably the most contentious issue that's going to come up in the next five years is the introduction of AI into clinical processes. Up to this point in the current moment, I've always advocated Mm -hmm. that VR is simply a tool that you need a well-trained clinician to do proper diagnosis, develop a treatment plan. If VR is relevant, then it gets included. But that the clinician is really driving the therapy or the treatment or the intervention, however you Mm -hmm. want to call it. So it's really just a tool. But now that you get into AI, on the far sci-fi end, can we have virtual therapists? And this will be the most contentious issue because... Let's pick it apart. On the positive side of things, you could say that AI Mm -hmm. has, it never tires. It's always available. It has encyclopedic knowledge of all clinical practice and all clinical conditions. It remembers Mm -hmm. everything you ever said to it in a clinical context. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are pretty powerful. (laughs) Yeah, that's a pretty good list on the pros. Yeah. Yeah. But if you look at the importance of the therapeutic relationship or therapeutic alliance on clinical outcomes. You see there's Mm -hmm. pretty strong effect size, regardless of the treatment approach, that there's something about Mm -hmm. interacting with a human that expresses empathy, shows that they understand your situation, can be honestly critical, that might bring awareness of something that your friends would never tell you. Um, and implement strategies from getting to know that person on a deeper emotional level. Mm -hmm. Those are powerful things too. Is there a middle ground here? Like, for example, we have such an underserved world of people with mental health issues. The World Health Organization, I think, estimates now something like a billion people on the planet with a mental health condition. And they also estimate that fully two-thirds will never see the inside of a therapy office. So Mm -hmm. how do we push care out in an ethically and professional fashion using Mm -hmm. technology, but still maintain its fidelity or its uh, usefulness? You don't want to build some online approach that Mm -hmm. deludes somebody into thinking that their difficult lifelong problems are going to be solved in a month of online Mm self-help therapy Mm -hmm. approaches. Now that may be a start and it may be a way to, again, like what I was mentioning with the Sim Coach Project, help people get a toe in the water, build some self-awareness before they talk to a live provider. What I don't agree with is ruling out out of hand that this technology has no place in clinical care because there is a lot of power. And you could make a case that you could have an AI assistant for a clinician such that, say you're doing teletherapy, like how we're communicating right now, maybe you have a piece of software that's analyzing your voice, if you're the patient, and picking up cues in the vocal acoustic properties of your speech Okay, that might be indicative of an issue or problem. And maybe I have a little earplug in that the software... Oh, is, that gives you that information. Yeah, and so it's decision support rather than decision-making. Skip, this has just been a fascinating 
conversation. And I'm wondering what would be, what's the takeaway to leave our listeners with when it comes to AI, virtual humans, mental health, this cutting edge technology? What's your takeaway? Well, certainly more science to be done and an evolving scientific okay. perspective. As the technology becomes more accessible, people are more aware of it. Clinicians are becoming more aware. I think we'll have an opportunity to have a greater impact on healthcare and maybe reduce the stigma of healthcare. That, I say fear not, as long as you guide this in an ethical and professional manner. Maybe we can cure some of the ills of modern technology and society that everybody seems to point to with, say, social media and so on. Okay. Maybe we can be the, the counterbalance to that and fix some of those problems by using technology, but in a thoughtful way. I also had the opportunity to talk to Dr. Mann. Dr. John Mann is trained in psychiatry and internal medicine and has a doctorate in neurochemistry. He helped create the guidelines for an app called Pathways that helps to treat depression. Well, Dr. Mann, welcome. It's a pleasure to talk with you today. COVID brought around a demand for telehealth, technology caught up to it. People now are bought in on the convenience. How about the provider side in the sense of what's the general response of providers to telehealth now? For providers, it's also better. First of all, appointments tend to run on time. The provider doesn't have to commute to the office. Okay. Even a provider like me who lives in an academic center, we have a building where all the doctors have their provider offices. Mm -hmm. But if you're an academic and you have a research division, group, lab, whatever, you have to walk from your lab over to the office and then you come back, all that's eliminated. So you have more time to see patients. You see them in a more uh, um, time-efficient fashion. And with practice now, and we've all had a lot of practice, we're not cardiologists trying to listen to somebody's chest. Psychiatry can function really quite well with telehealth. I think it's a win-win situation. It means okay. that with the same number of providers, we were able to provide and we are able to provide care to more people. How about the quality of care? And, and what are we learning on that as far as telehealth versus in-office care? I think that the uh, quality of care is pretty close, but two other developments have taken place to parallel this, which I think are ways of enhancing quality of care. One approach has been the continually build out of platforms that can deliver certain types of psychotherapy, which obviously CBT, okay. cognitive behavior therapy, is the main example. These uh, platforms are getting better and better, and there are more and more choices with these platforms. And psychotherapists take a long time to train, mm -hmm. and it takes many CBT sessions to get better and better and better at it. So um, being able to shift some of the load from live people onto these platforms is creating more capacity to deliver care, which is important because as we talked about a moment ago, the pipeline for delivering new psychotherapists hasn't gotten bigger. It's the same size pipeline, so we're very limited. The second thing is, is an idea that we've come up with at Columbia called Columbia Pathways. And it grew out of some work that we were doing looking at the treatment of depression, started in depression. We were looking at the treatment guidelines that have been in existence for many, many years with almost no modification, despite the fact that there's more and more data coming in and one could ask new questions and uh, review things. One of the areas that we were looking at was how the new data that was emerging might get us to rethink some aspects of, say, treatment of depression. Okay. So depression is very important because sometime in the next few years, within this decade, it will become the number one cause of disability worldwide. And as it is already in the Western world, it accounts for about half of all suicide deaths. So suicide is a major cause of death, second or third leading cause of death in young people and early adulthood. And it's about the 10th or 11th cause of death overall. 
it got bumped down a notch by COVID-19, but that's going to change. It's a huge cause of mortality. There are about 800,000 deaths due to suicide annually on the planet. Depression is not just the cause of disability. It's a very major cause of mortality. So improving the treatment of depression is important. Most adults with depression are treated by primary care physicians, GPs, Mm -hmm. or internists, a majority. The minority are treated by psychiatrists. We need to look at how to make the treatment easier to implement and make it better. So we came up with this app that you can download onto your phone. And in fact, our vision of this, patients and their families could download it on their phone. And then you could go along to your doctor and you can see all the things that are meant to be happening. Mm -hmm. So, for example, built into this app is a lot of stuff that the average doctor isn't conveniently available to them. For example, when you first see the patient, maybe you'd like to rule out bipolar disorder so that you don't trigger mood cycling in a patient by mistake because you you didn't ask about bipolar disorder. Right, right. And internists don't have the time or necessarily even the skills to ask and detect bipolar disorder in a patient that doesn't just tell them they've got it. In fact, there's a 10-year lag, 8 to 10-year lag between the development of bipolar disorder and its diagnosis in most patients. Wow. Yes. So meanwhile, the patient is going through tremendous problems because people haven't caught on to it. But we build into this app a screening evidence-based screening to okay. help the doctor quickly detect this without losing much time in a very efficient way. Mm-hmm. Then we build into the app a little rating scale on the severity of the depression because, mm-hmm. after all, when you're treating a patient with hypertension, you measure their blood pressure, right. and that's how you know how well they're doing. And when you're treating depression, you should be measuring the severity of their depression at each visit. That's how you know how well they're doing. This all fits in the same model of healthcare, Mm -hmm. and it just means better healthcare. You want to know how much better do they feel? Exactly. If they don't feel like a lot better, in our book, 80% better, Okay. that's not good enough. We go on adjusting the treatment till they get to like at least the 80% better mark. That's what we want everybody to do for their patients, not just Columbia doctors, but everybody. So this app gives you a rating scale. You can just, and it automatically pops up. You just, it's all done electronically. It's so Mm -hmm. simple. And then there's a thing in there for suicide risk. Obviously Mm -hmm. everybody should be asking about suicide risk. There's a huge emphasis on suicide risk, but a lot of GPs and a lot of internists aren't trained to do that, aren't good at that, are a bit scared about doing it in case they, they actually give the patient the idea to start thinking about suicide, which is obviously completely fallacious. You're just learning that they're thinking about exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you need to ask those questions. So there's a, the questions are there. Everything is systematic. The meds are there, like generic meds, less expensive meds, ones that are mm-hmm. more likely to be covered by the insurance. We have them hierarchically organized. We changed, we sped up the sequence of treatments because people can't wait that long to get better. Mm. Best results are in the first 12 weeks of treatment. After that, the response rate drops dramatically. So okay. we want to give the doctor and the patient the best chance of the patient getting better in the first 12 weeks by really making window. everything yeah. more efficient. We call it ASAP, Accelerated Sequential Antidepressant Program. Nice. ASAP. All right. <laughs> ASAP. Thank you. But the idea is just to raise the standard of care for everybody. Okay. Now we're moving this kind of app idea into other areas like anxiety disorders. Okay. And I think this is a strategy that can be used in all of medicine by giving doctors and the patient should see this, the family can see this, Mm -hmm. guidelines that are sensible, simple, Mm -hmm. but improved quality of care, Mm -hmm. some educational for the doctor. And the patients are going to benefit from this. What do we need to remember about that relationship now and in the future about the the human element of therapy and technology? One of the things that we try to teach medical students and doctors is it's not about all the tests. 
this is just information. You still have to go there, see mm. the patient, talk to the patient, understand the patient. All these tests are just ancillary. Okay. They help. Mm-hmm. They never replace the fundamental component, mm-hmm. which is the person talking to their healthcare professional. Okay. And that healthcare professional understanding them. Mm-hmm. The person always trumps everything in the tests. The tests provide extra information, but the person provides the context. Okay. The quicker the doctor can get or uh, the therapist can get all the information, yeah. the quicker they can come to an understanding of what's going on. And then they need to work with the patient or the person, the client, to explain what's going on. I'm a big believer if there's a diagnosis, you should know it and the person should know it. Mm-hmm. This isn't back in the old days of cancer where we didn't tell people they had cancer because it might frighten them. Oh this my is, we tell people when they have a psychiatric diagnosis. Yeah. That's part of destigmatizing exactly. this whole process. Yeah. And we tell them, here are the treatment options. Mm-hmm. And I think try this first, then this, then this, then this, or this combination or whatever it is. And here's why I think that. What do you think? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How does that work for you? Right? It's supposed to be a partnership. People, the, the patient's always a much better patient. They take better care of themselves right. if they understand what's going on mm-hmm. and what choices are and what's the basis for the choices. Yeah. So it, and I, that um, should never take place between the person and an avatar. Paul, I just think all of this is so fascinating. It's going to help so much with just the dissemination of information. I just think about physicians. The number one place where mental health shows up is in primary care. And primary care providers are prescribing medications. I think it's like 80% of them are not seeing a therapist. And so if you don't do your training as a psychiatrist, how do they really get to learn about mental health? And so I love that this notion that the app can help physicians really learn how to treat depression more effectively. Yeah, think about so much specializing that goes on in medicine, and yet the PCPs are really on the front line doing a lot of the work. And so to give them some really good guidelines on how to do the initial prescriptions and then how to monitor and make sure, because we, we know sometimes the first medicine doesn't work or the first dose isn't really to meet the need. Right. And that's, yeah, to really give them something in their hand. And then that the patients and families can also have access to that, that there's an educational component to it. Yeah. I mean, this notion about apps, like we just talked about being able to augment mental health, it's really interesting. If you have to wait two weeks for your appointment, it can really help keep things on track. And I love that the app asks for selfies so it can kind of analyze the facial expression. And it just, it has a lot of data that it could generate. I think it's just really cool that the person gives the context, but that the machine gives the data. Yeah, and think about mental health, like we didn't, you know, like a cardiologist, we don't have the lab test, we don't have the, the right. MRI. And to hear these biomarkers now that occur with like the tone of voice and the facial expression and how that can become part of measurement-based care that we start yeah. to have. You have this data now at your fingertips, so you you can spend your time now with the relationship aspect, which you know the research shows how powerful that is for the healing. And so the idea of the clinician, the doctor can focus on talking and understanding and not spending as much time trying to find the data. So Paul, talk to us about your next guest that you've had a conversation with. Yeah, so Dr. Hoffman is a New York City-based licensed clinical psychologist specializing in the evaluation and treatment of anxiety disorders, OCD, and related life challenges. She's created a virtual reality program which enables people to engage with and navigate those social situations that trigger anxiety and begin to sort of work through the anxiety and develop skills so they're not hampered by it. I'm interested. I'm really intrigued with all of this. I think this is so fascinating. Let's take a listen and hear what she has to say. Welcome, Dr. Hoffman. So good to have you with us today talking about virtual reality and mental health. 
Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. First of all, VR, virtual reality, we've heard the words, but making sure we know what we're talking about. So what exactly are we talking about using VR within the field of mental health? Yeah, so VR therapy typically involves the use of a head-mounted display or the, what's known as the headset or the VR goggles, okay, headphones, and in best case scenario, sensors that track an individual's eye movements and position oh, wow. in space. Okay, interesting. The software presents immersive 3D environments that transport the individual to a range of different settings. So you can have the virtual classroom, the virtual airplane, a really, really tall building. There's virtual Afghanistan for combat trauma Okay, and other settings like that. Which leads me to think, where are we seeing it already applied as far as particular conditions or symptoms? Where is it being used now? So VR has been used since the 90s and early 2000s oh, wow. for okay. women of anxiety disorders in particular. So primarily phobias, PTSD, and public speaking anxiety. So it okay. started out a couple decades ago as, as a way to conduct exposure therapy, which is a component of cognitive behavioral okay. therapy that involves repeatedly confronting feared situations in a gradual manner with the support of a therapist to, to learn worst case scenarios don't typically occur and you can tolerate or reduce anxious feelings. So VR was initially developed to do exposure therapy for feared situations that are really hard to recreate in the clinic. Fear of heights or fear of spiders, fear of flying. Those are the phobias. Okay. Combat trauma, social anxiety. And what are we seeing as far as the, um, in the research, as far as effectiveness of applying it in this way? Yeah, there's a ton of research on VR, particularly for the anxiety disorders that shows that it's effective, it's safe, and oftentimes actually preferred by patients and, and at times preferred by clinicians Interesting. as well. And how well does it generalize into real life then? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I think is where I hope that some of the future research will go. But what we know from okay. the research as it stands now is that VR exposure therapy and our traditional, it's called in vivo exposure therapy, are about the same in terms of their effectiveness oh, okay. for treatment yeah. outcomes. And there's some research that looks at not just right immediately after treatment, but that goes out months or, or even years okay. afterwards and is showing that VR can be just as effective. Excellent. And you made a reference, and I'm curious a little bit more, that some people actually prefer the VR type of exposure. And so I'm curious mm -hmm. about the range of patient responses to using VR. In my experience in using VR with patients, there are some patients that it's a nice first step for exposure therapy if, if they're feeling really apprehensive about getting okay. out into the world to, to do an exposure in real life, knowing that they can do it in VR, which feels like mm -hmm. you know, they can always take the headset off. It feels a little bit more right, good. right. Their control can be a, a nice place to start to build some confidence before going out into the world. For others, I do think as the technology is advancing, as people are becoming more aware of it, as gaming is out there, there are, especially our young people that are really okay. just sort of interested in it. And so I think it can be something that's more appealing to people. It can reduce the stigma or the classic image of sitting in talk therapy for people that might be more about that. And how about with telehealth? It gets me curious as far as applications, how does it work telehealth versus like in office? Yeah. So that's one of the areas that I'm most excited about for future research and program development is how we can okay. use VR remotely so that somebody could be sitting at home with a headset and the therapist could be miles away. And that really increases access to care mm -hmm. and broadens the reach of, of evidence-based practice. I don't know that, that the research or the program is, are, are there yet in terms of the remote delivery. There may be some out there that I'm not aware of for sure, but yeah. for the most part, the evidence base is for sort of in-clinic applications. And, and my sense is that that's on the horizon. I was wondering if it's that realistic. In office, you have a physical proximity with someone. And if they're home exposing themselves to something that feels realistic, how to make it as safe as possible, knowing part of the treatment is to, it feels a little unsafe or uncomfortable. I don't know if I'm phrasing that well. 
No, I think that's exactly it, is sort of how do we help people do this in a safe, gradual, controlled Okay. Well, it's one of the benefits of VR is is that the therapist has some control over an exposure. Uh, where it's yeah. typically out in the world, we don't have we send somebody out to go get near a dog or go talk to a person in a store. We don't know right. what's <laughs> okay. going to happen, right? It's sort of part of the exposure is the uncertainty of it. But okay. one of the benefits of VR is that we can actually control the responses that happen and we can repeat it over time. What's been the provider's response to to this sort of tool? I think from my personal experience using it in the clinic and with some of my colleagues, the providers are are excited about it because we can conduct exposures to things that are really hard to do otherwise. So the software, the program that that I was using at at Columbia was focused on social anxiety, particularly for college students and young adults. Yeah, yeah. And so if I have, you know, a college student or a young adult with public speaking anxiety. I would be having to plan days, weeks in advance, trying okay. to get people, like coworkers, team members, all available at the same time, come serve as you know the audience for this person, which was hard to do. And now with VR, we can sort of at that you know moment in that session decide, hey, let's go do a public speaking exposure. Have the person put on a headset, and all of a sudden they're in a classroom with twenty people. Another popular scenario for the program back at Columbia is. You ask your professor for an extension scenario. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so we have a, a few different, and that you know could be used for asking for a raise for your boss, or and we have some other assertiveness scenarios. Ask your your roommate to clean up the room. Right. And within that, we can customize, sort of pushing a little bit further to say, like, well, you you knew about this assignment weeks ago, so I can't grant you that extension or tell me more about why you couldn't get this done when your classmates could, or we could have the professor be more understanding and more flexible and tailor that directly to where the person is is starting and what they need. And I'm wondering, are there any negatives to be aware of around this sort of technology application? Some people experience dizziness or headaches or eye strain from being in the VR. That's oh, pretty okay. minimal. And, yeah. and most of the research thus far has shown like the effects of you know cyber sickness are, are pretty minimal. But I do think we need some more information about long-term effects or how long you're in the VR, if that ends up having mm-hmm. sort of impact on how people feel. Another negative is is just the cost. I mean, it's a it's a pro and oh, con. The costs okay. have have come down dramatically over okay. over the years. The cost of I should say the hardware, like the headset, the cost of a headset has come down. Programs can now be run on a regular desktop computer versus a really expensive gaming computer. Okay, but it's still expensive, and the cost of the VR software is particularly high. Yeah, I'm wondering for our listeners that maybe are curious, maybe they do have anxiety and they're looking for effective treatment. Is it something that becomes evident rather quickly if this is a good fit for you? So you could rule it in or rule it out easily. Well, the main thing we're looking for when we're looking for effectiveness of an exposure for exposure therapy is that anxiety is activated. So we need your networks to be sufficiently activated for an exposure to be effective or successful. So there are many people that put on a VR headset and they're like, whoa, look, I'm really there. I really feel like I know this is an avatar or I know this is, you know, a fake spider. It really feels real. And they're, they're activated. Okay. And that's a good sign for that VR therapy, VR exposure therapy could be useful. What's the dream to be able to do with VR? The dream for me, and I think for a lot of people with VR is, is using it as a tool to, to increase access to care. The ways that could go is sort of this remote VR that we were talking about a little bit earlier, where someone's at home with a headset and a therapist is miles away. Another pathway that I'm excited about, and I think others are as well, is is the idea of Mm -hmm. potentially self-guided or minimally guided VR. As the technology develops further, it's it's possible that someone could put on oh, a headset, you know, themselves okay. at home and sort of walk through some exposure modules, potentially with some support of a therapist or, or totally self-guided. There's some okay. de- people who are researching that right now. You can really fine-tune this and make it granular, which 
to me only makes it a better better exposure experience. So that's fascinating, the degree you can adjust it. That takes writing scripts that have all sorts of different paths to take on the therapist side of things and the software developer. My hope and expectation is that, and there may already be programs that exist like this out there, but in the future, that there will be some AI integration in there when it comes to verbal interactions with avatars so that less controlled by a therapist, but have some more ways to go in terms of outcomes for a conversation. Marjorie, this world of VR, virtual reality, is really fascinating. And I'm thinking about some treatment for anxiety and exposure therapy. And before, there were some limitations to how you can create sort of the steps to exposing someone to what they're fearful of. VR opens up a whole new world in how to do this. And I just think it's going to result in people getting better, faster, and better. I agree. I could not agree more. I think that we've got to have an open mind. I just think we have to be smart about it. We can't let AI make decisions for us, sway us into doing things we don't want to do. It, but what it can do is give us facts so that we could make more informed decisions and get more informed care. The future is here. Well said, yeah. I think we're going to do better work faster and reach more people. Like a carpenter not afraid of a hammer, I'm going to keep exploring it and see what we can do with it. I think we got to keep revisiting this so we can really just keep thinking about all the new cool things and what data can do even with wearables to help us even get to some mental health things ahead of time, yeah, right? If our yeah. heart rate's going up, does that mean that our anxiety is going to kick in? And I just, I'm excited to see where this whole kind of new space takes us. Lots more to learn and say on this. Thanks, Marjorie. Thank you for another great episode, Paul. Mm-hmm. I personally find these so, so interesting. And I'm excited to announce next week's topic because we're going to discuss introverts and extroverts. Oh, and cool. yeah. I am, as many people say, on the far, far end of the extroversion scale. But I just think it is so interesting to start thinking about where we derive our energy from. I'm excited for next week. I hope you all have a great week. Yeah, this was something that really came up during COVID. So that how different ends of the continuum responded. So can't wait to dive into it. Thanks, Marjorie. Have a great week. If you'd like to reach us, you can do so at podcast at scihub.com. To be notified of new episodes, don't forget to like, subscribe, or follow wherever you're listening. And reviews are so helpful, so please do leave one if you can. It will allow others to find us and join along. Coming Back Better is executive produced by Jacob Morrison. It is produced and edited by Juliana Castro. The series was developed in collaboration with Linda Rosenberg, Carla Cantor, and Kristen Watson from Columbia University Department of Psychiatry and Manisha Shah, Dr. Frank Drummond, and Amy Rushton from HCA Healthcare. Research is assisted by Melissa Leith. Show artwork was created by Arnella Jangoli and Ashton Smith. Audience strategy is by Alyssa Fagler, Sarah Hale, and Alyssa Yarama. A very special thanks to Andrea Rollback, Trevin Stagall, Evelyn Valentine, Kaylee Sneed, Julie Plummer, Thad Thomas, Paul Kay, and Elizabeth Roosevelt. Coming Back Better is a co-production from PsychHub and Columbia University Department of Psychiatry and is brought to you by HCA Healthcare. I'm Paul Dager and my co-host Marjorie Morrison and I thank you for joining us. See you next week.